Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks so, so much for joining me. Now in this video, what we're gonna start looking at is the first in our topics in conformity and obedience. And we're gonna spend some time looking at the nature of conformity, what it is, where it comes from, and some absolutely classic fundamental research into conformity here. Now just remember guys that conformity, obedience, these are mandatory topics within higher psychology. So, you know, it's likely that we're going to get a question, a very specific question. So this topic is worth knowing really, really well. So let's dive right in. I'm going to ask you a question here, guys. Have you ever done something that you yourself didn't really want to do, or at least you weren't really fussed about doing it, but you did it anyway, simply because your pals were doing it? Well, the answer is yes, right? Everybody's done that. Why? And the answer, of course, lies in conformity. And conformity we can define as social pressure to change your behaviour and or your beliefs in order to come into line with a group. So what do we mean the group? Well, this can come from one of two places. It can normally come from peers. These are the people that you surround yourself with in normal everyday life. Your friends, your family, your colleagues whatever it might be, those people are your peers. You surround yourself with them and whatever they're doing, you're going to do too. That's peer pressure. It can also come from media pressure. These are people that we identify with, uh, people like celebrities, people of note, people that are very intelligent that you see in the newspapers. These people can also have a very strong influence on behaviour as well. Now, conformity is typically unspoken. What I mean by that is we respond to what we observe others doing and we change our behaviour based on that so we can fit in. So it's normally unspoken. However, we can sometimes be asked by the group to do the same as they are doing, such as when you're in the pub, someone says, you'll have another drink, right? That's conformity spoken. Or, for example, Mean Girls, one of my absolute favourite films, we wear pink on Wednesdays. Um, Regina has been asked, or Regina rather, is asking that the, uh, the, the group falls into line and wears pink on Wednesday. So that is a spoken type of conformity, but just be aware that that's very much uh, the, the exception. Now, let's think about different types of conformity here. We're going to go upwards in terms of how complex it is and how deep the conformity goes. I'm going to talk about compliance to start with. This is the shallowest form of conformity. Compliance is what happens when a person just pretends to agree with a group, whilst individually and uniquely they maintain their own beliefs. So for example, imagine we've got a guy, his name is Tom, he's sitting in the cafeteria, he's not really fussed about taking his tray back, but he notices that everyone else has taken their tray back. So he decides to do the same. He doesn't want to go against the group. He hasn't really changed his opinion there, but he does it just to fit in with the group. The second form that goes a little bit deeper is something called identification. This is total agreement with a group, so you've changed your own beliefs as well, but it's only really temporary. Now we can define things like teenage phases as being a type of identification conformity. I've got Wednesday Adams here, Wednesday Adams, classic goth. Normally when we're going through our teenage phases, we dress a particular way, we act a particular way, but it doesn't last into adulthood. It normally lasts as long as you're a teenager. That's identification. The last form of conformity is the deepest form. This is called internalization. Permanent and total, long-lasting agreement with a particular group. So imagine we've got a girl, let's call her uh, Sally, why not? Sally spends a lot of time with her group of friends who love to rock climb, why not? And she comes to take up the sport. And long after she's fallen out of touch with those friends, she doesn't see them anymore. She still quite likes rock climbing. That is internalization, permanent agreement with a group. What is people's motivation to conform? Why do people feel the need or the desire to conform? Well, we can look at this in one of three ways. The first one we call informational influence. Why do people conform? because they want to be right. When uncertainty leads a person adopting the behaviour of others, they conform simply because they don't know what to do in themselves and they want to follow the correct path. 
Secondly, it could be down to normative influence. This is the desire to be liked or accepted. So when a person is not in doubt, they know exactly what the right thing to do is, but they're influenced by the social norms. The pressure comes from the group itself based on a need to be liked and accepted by it. We can also add a third one on here that's called ingratiational influence. It's a great word to say 10 times fast. Ingratiational, the desire to belong to a group. Humans, by and large, don't like to be alone. We like to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. So solitary behaviour is very much the exception. Group behaviour, that's where humans really shine. So man in the 1960s also adds ingratiational influence along with his motivations to conform. What research do we have here into conformity, guys? Well, let's think about something called the autokinetic effect. Sharif, way, way back in the 1930s, notices that when you see a tiny dot of light in a black room, it's not moving, but you think that it's moving. So what he does here is he gets people together and he asks them, first of all, individually, how far do you think that dot moved? And they'll say, oh, I think it moved to the left, a couple of inches maybe. And some people say, oh, maybe to the right, maybe a few feet. Doesn't really matter, they all give different opinions. However, when they're asked to do it in a group and call out their estimates aloud, what we find is that people's estimates conform. They start to come together. So this guy says it moved left. This guy says, no, it didn't. This guy wants to agree with both of them. So he says, well, it might have moved a little bit. Gradually, what we see is everybody has the same opinion. Not convinced yet? Let's go even bigger there. Key study to look at, Ash, 1951, the experiment into length of lines. This is absolutely critical study, the main, the absolute daddy of all conformity experiments. So what does Ash do in the 1950s? He gets 50 male Americans together in a room and sits them down one by one. In the room, there are another six men. The participants told that these six guys are also part of the study. They're not. They're all stooges. They're all confederates. They're all in on the experiment. So there's only one guy with a majority of six people surrounding him. What the uh, group is asked to do is match a line to a choice of three comparisons. So it's this one here. We're given the line. Which line of these, A, B, and C, is the closest matching? Now, the only participant in this group answered last or second to last, and he had to choose between two things because what had happened here was the group before him had given the wrong answer. We can look at this and say straight away, right, it's C, right? But however, imagine you're sitting there and the five guys before you say line B, line B, clearly line B. What are you going to do? Are you going to give the clearly correct answer and go against the group? Or are you going to conform to the group and give the blatantly wrong answer? What does Ash find? Well, he finds that on average, about a third of the participants conformed on the critical trials. The critical trials meaning the ones where the participants give the wrong answer. A third of people give the blatantly wrong answer so they don't look like a fool. That's incredible. 75% of participants conformed at least once and only a quarter of them never conformed. That means a majority of people will give the wrong answer to avoid looking foolish in front of the group. Amazing. In the control group, with no pressure to conform to Confederates, less than 1% of participants give the wrong answer. So clearly then, it's just the group that's influencing them here. Absolutely brilliant study, really, really good. Can we evaluate this? Well, of course we can. It's influential and a huge number of studies have built on this, but ultimately lacks ecological validity. This is done in a lab after all, not very realistic. Um, on that note, lack of realism. Well, how often are you asked to say how long lines are and compare them to one another? Normally, conformity is not so clear cut. It's a little bit more subtle than that. So it lacks realism. And we also have issues of culture at the time. 1950s America, we've got McCarthyism, communist witch hunts. Maybe people didn't want to be the odd one out. Perrin and Spencer in the 1980s do the same thing again with British students this time and they find very, very low levels of conformity. So maybe it's just because of where and when Ash does his study rather than the actual conformity itself. What happens when we change this around a bit? What happens when we make the majority naive participants and only put a minority in 
who are in on the experiments. Does a minority also affect the majority? Well, let's see. Moscovici in the 1960s studies exactly this. What he does is he plants two stooges in a group of six that had the task of naming the colours on a set of slides. Now the Confederates, the two people there, had been told to call certain blue slides, so it's clearly blue, they were told to call them green. And what happened here is that the true participants, although very lightly, did show signs of being influenced. Just under 10% of the participants followed the minority considerably more than the control, so it does seem here that the minority can also have a, an influence on the majority. Could this perhaps explain things like the suffragette movements or Nazism, very small beginnings, very much in the minority, that because of uh, a persistent approach, they gradually come into prominence. Perhaps this is our explanation about these different groups here. Key concepts then guys, these are everything we've gone over in this small video here. If you understand what all these different things are and are able to explain them, then you're off to an absolute winner. Thanks a lot guys, join me again for our next video when we'll be looking at the explanations of conformity. In other words, what factors affect how and why people conform. Until then guys, have a lovely, lovely day and we'll see you again next time. Cheers!